Okay, thanks, Greg. Um, cool. So I'm not going to give you like a one-on-one -on -one product marketing talk tonight. So I hope you didn't come here for that. I'm actually going to dive deep into one of my favorite topics, which is pricing. Um, I work have worked on pricing across a couple of companies, and I think it's a super valuable skill to have, and just a really interesting. Um, I think it'll be interesting to do a bit of a deep dive on this topic. I think it's really topical for a lot of SaaS companies. So. Um, so we'll start with the boring stuff first. Um, I worked for a company called Safety Culture back in the day, so I'm a Townsville girl, born and bred. Um, started there in Townsville, worked there for about four years. Um, saw the company grow from, uh, go on a huge growth arc. So I think I started at like employee number 24. Um, when I left, there were like employee number, there was like 350 employees. Um, I felt like that was a pretty good time to kind of switch into a larger company and just to see what product marketing could look like at scale. Um, so I worked at Elastium for two and a half years on a product called Jura Service Desk, it's now Jura Service Management. Um, and now I work at Quilla, so as the product marketing lead there. Um, and I just joined maybe five or six months ago. Um, so it's a Series A startup that's based out of Sydney, but I work remotely from Brisbane, which is awesome. Cool. Um, so on the side, I also teach a product marketing core certification course. So there's, um, so I teach the one just for APAC and it's like a one day intensive or it's like over a four week kind of course as well. Um, and that one's really just designed to give like a high level overview of everything you'll ever encounter in product marketing. So it's actually a really useful course. Um, so I will not spend too much time going into like a definition of product marketing, but I think the easiest way to understand product marketing is to look at all the activities that it covers. So it is an incredibly cross-functional role and it touches a lot of areas of the business. So some of the things that we look at is go to market strategy, like how do we actually take this product and feature to market? What segments to go after? How do we position in the market where we think we can win? Um, we also do sometimes work with demand gen, uh, often work with demand gen uh, marketers to kind of gain new leads and, and bring in new customers. Um, and then we also do a lot on the product side. So that's where we cross over with customer success and support because we really care about how this features be, how features are being used, how the product is being adopted um, to ensure the kind of long-term success of our customers. And then competitive research is something that I care really deeply about as well. Um, I have done a few talks on this topic, but really truly understanding your market and your competitive space, I think is kind of like the superpower of, of PMM. So, um, but I won't spend any time on that. Today, I'm going to dive into pricing. Cool, so I think pricing is such an interesting area because it's, it's kind of like an untapped growth lever for a business. Um, a lot of SaaS companies today, they just spend like 30 minutes on their pricing strategy. They you know, raise some prices, roll out some comms, and that's it, pricing done for the next couple of years. Um, never really measure the impact. Mm, churn looks okay, growth looks okay. Um, so I think it's an untapped potential area, and I think um, it's a really interesting space for PMM to kind of own as well, because it is such a strategic function in a business. So before I dive into the kind of research behind pricing, um, I'm going to walk you through some of the products, um, some of the pricing projects that I've worked on at some of the companies. So at Safety Culture, back in the day, um, we kind of raised prices a couple of times um, throughout my time there over like three and a half years. Uh, and then in the end, uh, I think it was like six months before I left, we kind of engaged with this company called Price Intelligently back in the day. They're also known as ProfitWell. Um, I think they're fairly well known at the moment. They're a consultancy that's based out of Boston um, and they do a lot of amazing research and they're actually a consultancy as well that has worked with some of the biggest SaaS companies in the world to roll out value-based pricing. So pricing at Atlassian, um, one of the first projects that I walked into when I started there day one, um, but I worked with a awesome cross-functional group there. So it was like, made up of a product manager who kind of led the project. Um, and then we also worked with a designer and a couple of program manager and a couple of other people. So we were like the core kind of pricing group just for Jura Service Desk, but they also had like kind of a pricing steering committee that led a lot of the go-to-market messaging around how pricing was rolled out. So when I was there, they rolled out free. Um, and then with that team, I also worked on rolling out premium for Jura Service Desk at the time as well. 
and then worked with a go-to-market team that was made up of all of the product, mar a product marketing rep from each kind of product area, and we worked on driving upgrades and growth for our paid tiers as well. And then at Quilla, so where I am now, um, and I think it's the research side of pricing is really exciting to me, and I love the kind of data that, that comes back to it, so um, I'm gonna walk you through some of that. So let's go through a crash course in that. Um, there's a lot of information, so I'm gonna carve it off and only talk about like two sections of the project tonight. So we'll start from the top. Um, a pricing strategy starts with four components, and that's the model. So whether it's gonna be value-based, cost plus, um, there's the value metric. So that's a, a, a metric that kind of scales with price and, and is aligned to the core user motivation of your product. And then there's the price point. What are you actually gonna charge for your product? And then the packaging, how are you actually gonna um, configure all of the features and, and what makes sense to put in, in what price point. So I'm gonna walk through some of the, the models first. And this is generally one of the first things that you go through in a pricing project. You're like, okay, well, what type of model are we gonna select for our pricing? And sometimes that's already, you would already inherit that as a product marketer because the product is already aligned around a specific kind of model. Um, other times you get to start from scratch from a blank slate and figure out like what actual model would work for our company. So there's three common pricing models. There's the cost plus, which is essentially like just understanding your margins and then adding some cost on. It's not really common in SaaS that you see at all, more common in like uh, kind of goods and, and hardware and things like that. There's competitive pricing, which I think is where a lot of SaaS companies start out in the day. So you just look at what your competitors or what the market's doing in the space and you're like, okay, well, we might, might like slightly undercut the market because we're new and we're agile and we have a small team. And then as a company matures, you start to evolve to something called value-based pricing. And value-based pricing is really like the intersection of what your customers are willing to pay and the value that you provide. So value metric is another really important part of a pricing strategy. And a value metric is what I said before, like a metric that scales with price that's aligned to your core user motivation. So this is not something that you just like select. It's something that you research and try and understand, well, what do our, what do our customers really value and how do they want to be charged for our product? So examples of this is um, Unbounce, their pricing model revolves around conversions because um, they did a similar research project, rolled out a survey, and their customers um, kind of wanted to be charged by the outcome of what you could do with Unbounce. So Unbounce is like a landing page um, kind of optimization tool. And then there's more of like outcome value metrics as well, um, which is something that like an Eventbrite uh, ticket is something that you get once you've like achieved something in the product. So there's a lot of evidence and I won't spend too much time into this because ProfitWell and Price Intelligently has documented this really well, but value metrics is something you care about because it's, it really increases your growth rate and there's a lot of evidence around why you should be aligned and build a pricing strategy around what your users value and what they're willing to pay. And then the last two points, pretty obvious, uh, price point and packaging. Cool, so value-based pricing, and I think a reason a lot of companies don't do it is because it takes so long and it's so research intensive and you need to have like a really committed cross-functional team that's gonna be dedicated to this probably for the next like six to 12 months because that's generally how long it takes to roll out a new pricing strategy that has the model of value-based pricing. Um, but I'm gonna dive into the research side. So I'm gonna talk about, um, so there's a lot of phases of pricing and it's because the pricing project is so big, you gotta break it up into a lot of different sections and there's different stakeholders that's kind of involved at each section. So um, I'm going to talk about the problem identification, which is like arguably the most important part of it. And then I'm also gonna talk about the kind of research and how you actually design that survey to understand what your customers are willing to pay and what they value in your product. So I'm gonna spend some time talking about the problem identification. 
Now, it sounds really, really obvious, but you need to spend like a shitload of time on this. It is so important to get your problems identified with all your stakeholders. And it sounds like it's so amazing how um, easy it is to dismiss this. Like, so it's important to allow like all your stakeholders to put their own like problem identification docs together and then bring it together and truly understand, well, what are we actually gonna do with a pricing strategy? Does it need to be around upgrade paths? Is that the problem that customers aren't migrating to different plans? Or is it that the composition of our packages is strange and the sales team is telling us that um, they're having to discount heavily because people are saying it's too, too expensive or they're having to like custom create packages every time and kind of borrow features from other plans. So these are the, some of the common things and, and then the idea then is to also rank them because a pricing strategy isn't gonna solve everything and you have to focus the research somewhere. So having an understanding of what's an absolute must have and what's a nice to have is really important to go into this as well. So this is a framework that we used at Quilla to do this. I sit around to all the stakeholders. Um, we then like kind of grouped all of the problem areas. Sometimes people will put problems down and it's actually not a pricing and packaging problem. Sometimes it's something to do with the, the purchase journey or something that the pricing page isn't quite optimized to allow customers to kind of choose something that they need. Um, and then it's also important to understand why does this matter? There's a lot of stuff that you'll, you'll collect and you'll be like, yeah, it's like probably a problem, but will it actually have an impact on, on business metrics that we care about? So that's how we kind of flushed out like a lot of the stuff that we didn't need. And then the examples and evidence. Sometimes a problem isn't really a problem. So you should have some evidence and kind of data behind you as to why you're actually like prioritizing the top three problems that you go after. Um, so this is what we use as like our guardrail. Um, and we did this at the start of the kind of project and then we have referred to the, these guardrails every single conversation we've had about pricing. Um, you get a lot of data back from a survey and, and you're wading through and you're figuring out like how to put these packages together, what price point it should be. And you get a little bit lost in the data sometimes. So. Um, we revisited this every time we're kind of designing like a new packaging slice. We come back and go, oh, well, the kind of packaging that we came up with wasn't actually like aligned to the problems that we'd actually identified and the goals that we'd identified. So having this like source of truth is super valuable to have throughout the project. And then it's equally important to understand who you're actually building the packages for. So the reason that product marketing often will own a pricing strategy is because they're the ones that are often developing the buyer personas. And there has to be packages and pricing aligned to your buyer personas. You have to know who's actually buying your product and who are the most valuable, who the most valuable segment is. There's a lot of customers out there, so understanding your customer segmentation and who the most profitable customers are will help you figure out what your packaging should be and who you should actually be surveying as well. Um, we didn't survey everyone in our customer base. Um, at Quilla, we, did, we went, only went for our kind of core buyer personas and we segmented our customer base that way. And then we also kind of cross-referenced that and did a market panel as well of like our proxy customers. So um, I think it's important to get a read on your current customer base but it's also important to get a read on what your market wants as well, like who your future potential buyers and what they want to. So now that we've figured out the problems, we've understood the goals, um, I'm gonna get into what the actual composition of the survey kind of looks like. So like any good research project, you start with the questions. What do we actually need to know? And then figure out the kind of methodology from there. I wanted to know, is our pricing, is our price point that we charge today on all our plans the correct one? Or do we need to kind of reevaluate that? Um, we wanted to know, is our packaging correct today? Uh, we haven't updated it in a while. Is it aligned to like all of the new research and, and how we understand our customers at this point? And then what are we base, are we basing that on the best value metric? Um, we wanted to do some exploratory research there. Uh, so the research group was myself, a product manager, 
Um, I strongly believe product management should be involved in pricing. Um, you often hear that they're not. They, there's so much like feature discussion that goes on at this point um, that you present in your survey that they just absolutely need to be there. And it's such a, a valuable perspective, I think, to have in this, this instance as well. Um, so we kind of categorized some of the things that we, the research questions that we wanted to know by whether it was gonna be actionable in the next quarter or whether we were only doing kind of generative like exploratory research on this. Like, So the survey method that we chose is called a max diff. Um, a max diff kind of chooses, uh, allows your, or forces your kind of respondent to select something that is the least and most important. Um, this is really important because what you end up getting if you don't do this and they do this weird kind of feature ranking is that you can't really make decisions from that. And I'll show you why in a second. Um, so why we chose a survey approach. So um, sometimes companies won't go down the survey route and they'll just instead kind of select like a panel of, of 10 to 20 customers to um, interview and then understand things like value metric, price point and packaging. And then you get some really interesting data when you combine um, that kind of max diff like feature importance ranking with things like willingness to pay, um, you can slice it by role, by industry, and it just gives you like this melting pot of all this data that you have all these viewpoints you can make decisions from. So that's what a feature ranking survey is, and I think a lot of people do it that way because that's just the normal way to kind of do a survey, like tell me from one to 10 what you find the most important. But if you see on the right, you start to understand oh, like custom branding is really not truly valued. So branding is probably something that you put on across all your tiers because it's not really valued. Whereas something like maybe report customization, if you do a few more slices, you're like, oh, there's actually like a high kind of willingness to pay there. So we may just have that on a higher tier. So this is how we designed the survey. So we had um, what I call like context setting and they're the questions that are like, you know, tell me what your title is, what industry do you work in, what size is your company? Um, because you do want that view that you, so you can slice the data later. Um, we also had a section, what we called like the value metric discovery. So this was a question that was worded like, um, you know, tell me how you would prefer to be priced. Um, and it was just one question that, that forced them to kind of make a, make a choice there. And then we had the packaging questions, which we, we use to make packaging decisions, which is the feature trade-off. So um, feel free to ask me more questions on, on how we did that later, but I'll quickly kind of give you a view. Um, we broke it up into feature categories of core functionality, but we also wanted to test the kind of value of future features as well. So we peppered a few like future feature options in there as well, because we just wanted to see um, whether they place more importance on what we have today. Um, and we also had a section around if integrations is something that your product is, is really important to you, then have an integration section. Um, common sections are like admin, support, but I will say that it's not like an opportunity to just put your entire feature list in there from your pricing page. Um, you really have to understand, well, what do I absolutely need to know? Um, and things like, say, for example, you want to understand an account manager. If you know that account management, if, if you um, put an account manager on like every plan, it's not an economical choice, then you probably don't need a survey to tell you that. You just know that you're going to only provide account management to the highest tiers. So it's understanding what you absolutely need to have data on and a lot of data as well. Um, I will say with a max diff survey approach, um, you have to have statistical significance. You have to have at least kind of 200 survey results to actually make some decisions from. Otherwise, it, it just, you start slicing it down and you just start like wiping out kind of the significance of it. So, um, and then there's something that, that I wanted to do was like, we, we have these like eight categories of features that we wanted to test. Um, but we also wanted to understand which of those feature categories did our customers and, and, and the market uh, really value. So we did that in the form of value prop testing. And then 
the really interesting area is willingness to pay. Um, so we use a common method that's used in the industry. It's called Van Westendorp. Um, that's a really common way to kind of understand what the, it's like called the price sensitivity meter. It's a common way to understand what, what is too expensive, what is least expensive. What I said there. So um, why it's important to have that within your survey is because just because you get uh, so you, you get the data back and you're like, okay, these are, this feature seems really important. Once you slice it across with willingness to pay, sometimes you'll find that there's not a high willingness to pay for the most important range feature. Um, so you want to have that as an additional viewpoint to make a packaging decision from. And then while that survey is kind of out, I think it's um, an, an additional viewpoint that you want is how do your competitors price? Um, so this is a graph that uh, we developed at Atlassian with the kind of pricing research group. And for us, when we were launching premium, we, we wanted to understand what type of market share we could go after with having a premium offering and how that compared to our competitors in the space. So when it comes down to making packaging decisions, you're often like referencing, you're like, oh, well, where does our competitor put, put a feature like support or live chat? Um, so it's good to have that as a reference point. And then you want to build a story with your data. So um, I think it's really important to bring your execs on, especially if they want to, with the details. So um, we did that. We put it all on a Notion page, and we had a consistent kind of framing of how we presented the data to them. So for us, it looked like having like a market and customer panel breakdown. So we wanted to understand like who actually took our survey. Um, now, we did this through SurveyMonkey. Um, really like one of the only market survey tools that you can get that has such a large market panel to go after. Um, so we did that. We also looked at the company size of the people that came through. Um, and by role as well, you want to understand whether decision makers are taking a survey because sometimes decision makers versus the end user will have wildly different results come through on your survey. So you, that's like an additional slice of information there. And then industry, sometimes you'll, like with SurveyMonkey, that you'll sneak through with all these random industries that you kind of don't care about. That's another good way to kind of like do some data hygiene and slice out that as well. And then within the e each feature category, we broke it down into, so we had an aggregate view of just what people placed importance on. Um, we had an industry view for each feature category, a role, sales team size, and then we sliced it over with willingness to pay. And this is what we did times eight for each kind of feature category and presented that back to our execs, kind of gave them like two weeks to mull over it. And then while they were mulling over it, um, the research team was designing some package, early package concepts that we then present back to them. So this is what I mean by a feature aggregate. It's just like, a pretty simple look on how the survey results came back. Um, now, I don't do any of like the data slicing. Like We have an amazing RevOps person who is like a wizard at Excel. So um, this is why it's super important to be so cross-functional. Um, it's important to know where your skills tap out. And for me, that's not slicing data in Excel. So um, we hand that over to someone else. This is like what it looks like feature, um, feature preference by role. It's another like super interesting view of what people um, kind of expect. And then this is what your willingness to pay looks like. So you've got all of these features that they've, they've said is important, but you know maybe they ranked uh, email support as super important and something that they um, would like. But then when you look at this graph, you're like, oh, it actually, like it's on the left, people don't really value it. So we put email support across all the plans. But something like account management has a high willingness to pay. We're going to charge more for that. We're going to put it on an enterprise. Something like implementation support, lukewarm. Maybe we'll have it as an add-on. Um, so you start to understand all of these things and, and um, be able to put it together. So when it comes to actually designing the package concepts, um, that's where it gets really interesting. You'll go through like a lot of iterations of that. Um, but it's ideal to kind of put something, only like two to three concepts together that you can present back to your execs. Um, something that we did at Quilla that I think was really effective was 
just have like a little, almost like a tweet for each package that we presented back. Um, so they could get a really high level view of, oh, okay, this is what this concept is trying to do. This is what the second concept is trying to do. Um, but packaging is an art and science. So I'd recommend like putting a list together of areas that you'd want to validate. Um, value metric is definitely something you don't want to take that decision lightly, particularly if you're going to change your entire kind of pricing model around it. Um, so that's something that you definitely want to do a bit more research on. Cool. And then create a really tight uh, feedback loop with your exec. So um, we presented that back to our pricing steering committee, which is pretty much like consists of the founders, the head of engineering, head of design. It's important to include like the research and development side, the R&D side of a business, because they're the ones that kind of get lumped with like the implementation side of it. So part of understanding whether a package is going to be feasible to change is understanding, well, will this take us 12 months to implement? That's probably not gonna be super economical for the business. We're like gonna tie up an entire product team to go build out and, and create these gates for these features. Um, and then equally, we're gonna suck a lot of design resources here. Um, so that kind of goes into the factoring of the financial modeling. Um, and again, we had a RevOps person uh, at the concept phase do some kind of lightweight financial modeling. Um, and then from there, once you've like selected a direction and a concept, that's when they do a pretty like heavy kind of financial modeling to, to truly understand what the rollout strategy could be. Are you gonna force people to migrate within six months? Are you gonna give them a 12 month grandfathering period? Um, are you gonna split the plans? Are you gonna have like an old, business or start a plan, or are you gonna have a new one? And that's gonna be the incentive to kind of drive people onto the new plan. So there's so many ways you can um, do that rollout strategy, but you wanna understand what's the, the impact to the business um, and is there a positive kind of revenue implication and, and how long is that gonna to take to make that up? So that's a lot of steps. Um, I really like pricing, but feel free if you wanna know anything more general about product marketing, um, to kind of ask me in the Q&A as well. But I'll quickly go through some of my key takeaways and then I'll hand it back to Greg. Um, so problem identification needs to involve absolutely everyone. Um, pricing projects get railroaded if you haven't identified the right problems up front. Um, get super tight on that and then identify who your packages are for. So um, understanding who your buyer personas are and having that, that clear and then having your execs agree on that. Um, and determine what is kind of actionable and generative in your research project. And then what we did at the end of the survey was like start stripping out questions or like, we don't need that. We don't need to like consume people's time with that. We could probably make a decision on that. Um, so be really, really ruthless there. And then my favorite one, just because a feature is important, doesn't mean it has a high willingness to pay. So it's super important to understand that. So yeah, pricing packaging. 